welcome to a very special edition of the Tough Girl podcast. Now, I know I might sound like Sarah, but don't be fooled. I'm actually her sister, Caroline Wellingham. I have the huge honour of interviewing Sarah at the end of her epic adventure walking the Appalachian Trail in 100 days. For anyone who doesn't know much about the trail, it's a total distance of 2,190 miles through 14 American states, starting in Georgia and finishing in Maine. To put this into perspective, Sarah walked around 85 marathons over the course of 100 days. We're going to talk through her journey from start to finish, including the highs, the lows, the rocks, the bears, trail magic, and lots of the fantastic stories along the way. I would just like to say a massive well done from myself, her family, her friends, and all of the Tough Girl tribe. Well done, Sarah. Well, welcome to the podcast, Sarah. It's great to have you on here with some other fantastic women that have been before you. So we've got lots of questions from the Tough Girl Facebook group. And so I just want to make sure we get through as many as possible. But firstly, let's start at the very beginning. Can you tell me why in the world you decided to walk the Appalachian Trail? Oh, it's such a great question to start with and possibly one of the most difficult ones to answer. I suppose, I don't really know, but I think a seed got planted. And when I look back at some of my previous challenges from running marathons and doing the Marathon de Saab and climbing Kilimanjaro, they've always been sort of shorter challenges, but you end up training, you know, four months for a marathon, um, 18 months for Marathon de Saab, and it was over within a week. And I suppose for my next challenge, I just wanted something that was going to be longer over a longer duration and something that would really push me to my physical and mental limits and I started hearing about these long distance walking trails mainly through listening to um or hearing about like Cheryl Strayed and Wild and her doing the PCT the Pacific Coast uh Pacific Crest Trail and the Appalachian Trail just kept coming up and I ended up speaking to a girl called Dixie for the podcast and I think the seed got planted and you know normally most people walk the trail within five or six months I just couldn't take that much time off and it slowly evolved until suddenly it was like yes this is going to be ideal I can walk the Appalachian Trail I can do it in 100 days I can finish in September And it's going to challenge me, but it's going to be fun. I'm going to get back to nature. I'm going to get back outside again. And I I don't know if that's a good enough reason to do it, but um, I was definitely looking for a a challenge. And you certainly found it with this adventure, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So you spoke a lot about your preparation on your daily podcast and on your blog before you headed off. So if people do want to find out more about that, then check out the Tough Girl YouTube channel. However, I know that you put a huge amount of effort into your original preparation. Can you just talk me through what, if anything, you would have done differently or what kit you would have changed? Yeah, I suppose um, I suppose really the preparation was broken down into the physical and the mental. One side that I didn't look at was almost the emotional intensity and of some of the highs and some of the low points. But I don't know how I could have really trained for that or, or done anything about it. I suppose the easier one to almost plan and prepare for would be the physical. And for me, because I was doing it very piecemeal, as in getting my equipment, you know, when I had the funds available, I'd buy the equipment. And a couple of my last purchases were things like my backpack. So I was taking the Osprey backpack with me. And um, and I only had it maybe four or five weeks beforehand. If I'd done it again, I think that would have been one of my first purchases and I would have trained with it a lot more. I still trained with a backpack, but it wasn't the backpack that I took with me. A lot of my training was done on a flat ground. So we have this place called the Wirral Way, which is this um, 12-mile footpath in one way, 12-mile footpath footpath the other way so very very flat so I probably should have done some more hills even though I did get outside in terms of equipment I think the only thing I'd possibly train with more would be my walking poles because I didn't really train or didn't use them until I got on the Appalachian Trail so um, yeah. So if we just start from the beginning Talk me through how you were feeling from the point of getting on the plane in London to day one arriving at the actual Appalachian Trail. Do you know what's really interesting? I actually felt really 
calm about it all and very relaxed and actually very ready for it. It was very, very different to how I felt before um, MDS, where I was sort of anxious. I was very, very nervous. I just felt ready for this challenge. I felt as though I'd done all the training. I felt as though I'd done all the preparation. I felt, I just felt ready for it. And I was just, um, I suppose I was more excited than anything else, really. So you arrive at the trail on day one. What happens next? <laughs> yeah, getting getting to the trail day one. So it is the 3rd of June, a Saturday. And um, I weighed my backpack that morning. I stayed at a hostel. My backpack weighed something like 32 kilograms. And I didn't think it was that heavy. Um, started out at Springer Mountain. There's a car park a mile from the top of Springer Mountain. And got to the car park, dropped off. There was another guy there with me called John, who was also doing the trail. And so we did the one mile trail up to officially start. And we started around 11 o'clock on, um, on Saturday the 3rd. And to be honest, it was just sort of pure excitement getting to the top, carrying the backpack. And uh, yeah, it was just, I think it was just being out there. And to be honest, I couldn't really believe it because I'd watched so many like YouTube videos. I'd seen so many photos of the start and of the view and seeing this plaque in the rock. And then when you're actually physically there, it was suddenly like, wow, this is real. I've given myself this challenge of getting to Mount Katahdin in a hundred days and reaching it by, reaching it by the 10th of September. But I still felt I felt strong. I felt good. And because um, I basically had stopped my training about three or four weeks beforehand. So when you, you know, when you stop training, you almost have this buildup of energy and you're just like, you're so ready to get going. And that was the feeling. It was like, right, let's get on it. Let's get walking. Let's get moving. And I think on my first day, I ended up doing uh, 15, just shy of 16 miles. So I was really, really pleased with, with the start and how and how it went. But it was filtering water for the first time. It was setting up my tent for the first time. So lots of new experiences um, happening. So how long did it take you to get into a routine? So routines were something that I had actually thought about quite a lot before I started the trail because I knew I wasn't going to have months and months to get ready for it. So for me, I actually thought a lot about how I could be the most efficient and effective both in the morning when I'm having to get up and to and to leave my camp as well as as we know when I'm walking when do I stop how what do I keep doing as well as the evening you know what do I do when I arrive at the shelter what's the what's the most efficient way for me to to organize things is it to get water first or is it to put my tent up when do I blow up my air mattress you know when do I hang up my food bag when do I when do I brush my teeth etc I still think it did take me I'd say about two weeks really two three weeks for me to really know what I was doing and just to be a bit more efficient about everything and did you have a favorite part of your day <laughs> probably getting getting to the shelter Arrive or seeing seeing the shelter sign and knowing that my day was over and that I could eat and just get into get into bed basically and start my rest and recovery. Um, I think generally throughout the day, sometimes you know you'd have these amazing highs and these lows, but actually just getting into my sleeping bag was one of my highlights. Mm-hmm. So, how did your body cope with initially with the walking? So, after the first sort of couple of weeks, how were you coping with it? I was absolutely fine for the, I mean, when I did my physical training, I was working with personal trainer, Chris Thomas, it was all about basically the first two to three weeks, because you can't train to do what I've done. It's something that you have to develop as as you go. So I was strong, I was fit, I was healthy. And even, you know, at the start going through um, this, through the Smokies, I was doing you know, averaging about 22 miles and 24 miles. So I was pleased with my strength and my walking and my, um, and my endurance. I mean, I did have a couple of tough days, um, especially like after the Smokies, it was like, actually, do you know what? I need to rest now and actually take some time off and just have, um, you know, just do a shorter day where I only did like five miles. But I think I got into it pretty quickly, especially after the first 20, 25 days. I was managing to bash out at least definitely in the 20s every single day. So 26 miles, 22 miles, 24 miles. And there's obviously there's easier sections on the Appalachian Trail and there's harder sections on the Appalachian Trail. So a lot of the time it did also depend on what the terrain was like. And also at the beginning, Um, it was lighter for a lot longer. So I could still be walking up to like nine o'clock in the evening. So I generally would walk until it went dark. Talk me through the first key milestone that you came up against. Was that 100 miles? Um, I actually missed the 100 mile marker. (laughs) 
<laughs> which which I was really gutted about. So generally, you know, at the hundred mile, two hundred, three, four, five, etc., they'd have um, they they'd have these either the numbers made out of twigs or stones, and it would be super exciting. But I think that the one that really stands out in my memory uh, was I saw either going to be four hundred or six hundred. I think it was possibly the six hundred mile mark. I'd had a really long day, and I reached it. At, sorry, I hadn't really had a really long day. I'd reached it at maybe like four o'clock and I bashed out 24 miles or something like that. And I reached this 600 mile marker and I knew it was only like another two miles to the shelter, got to the shelter at like half five. And that was phenomenal for me because I, A, I'd walked super far. I passed the 600 miles. I got to a shelter at a decent time. There was somebody else there who was going to cook me food. I managed to, um, you know, wash my feet, get my water done, get set up and actually have a little bit of chilling time. So just when I wasn't having to do anything. So I think the 600 mile marker was a big one. The the other one, which was, I think, psychologically pretty amazing was the thousand mile marker because it was like a thousand miles. It's, it's crazy to think back to it. It's just like, wow, it almost becomes unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And I bet when you think back, you're literally like, wow, I can't even believe I got to 1,000 miles and then 2,000 and you did it. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So talk me through some of the people you met along the way. So the people who inspired you and also about some of the kindness that you received. Oh, I mean, this is one of the things I'd read a lot about trail magic and trail angels. But there are just so many incredible people on the Appalachian Trail and all the other hikers as well who are out there, whether they are through hiking, whether they are slack packing, whether they are section hiking or just out for the weekend. You just get to meet these incredible people. I've had so many people, you know, cook food for me. A lot of it's going to re- revolve around food. And <laughs> but you know, people giving you food, setting up these barbecue stations when you cross roads, um, giving you drinks. And it's just it is the kindness of strangers and sometimes people talk about how um, the trail will provide so sometimes you think oh you know I'm really struggling so for example in the first sort of five days my right knee had actually sort of blown up and I was having quite a lot of trouble with it and I met a lady and she was like oh my goodness I've got a knee brace you can have or uh, you know a knee protector thing so gave me that to me I twisted my left ankle quite a few times I kept going over on the same ankle sort of day after day after day met another lady who was you know gave me a bandage to help support my to support my foot and just all the way along there was just so many people who would um you know hitch would would you you'd hitch a ride they'd drive you into town they'd tell you where to go and it was just um, it was just inspiring, really. I mean, one of the nice things um, for me was actually getting to meet members of the Tough Girl Tribe. So um, an awesome member of the tribe called Becca, she we'd actually planned this. Um, and because I didn't really know the area quite well, we ended up meeting at the top of Clingman's Dome, which is like the highest point on the Appalachian Trail. And I think I said to Becca, I said, yeah, I think I'll be there at about six o'clock. I wasn't. It was a, it was a really, really steep, steep, steep climb. And this was like something on like day 11. And um, Becca had actually driven for six hours to come and meet me and ended up waiting for two hours in the pouring rain. She'd brought me like resupply. She'd also had, um, I'd had some boxes sent to her with some, you know, with food in and stuff like this. And she brought it all out. And that was just, that was just amazing. And also, you know, I got to meet some incredible women in New York State, um, Sharon, Pam and Barbara, who came and, you know, met me at the, met me at the roadside with signs. They took me back to their house. They gave me clothes to wear. They let me use their shower. They fed me. They did a full resupply for me. It's just, it's honestly, it's just in, incredible. I mean, I could probably just spend, you know, almost like an hour talking about all the all of the individuals that are out on the trail. And sometimes the meetings are only fleeting. You know, they last whether it's they last a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. But it's just amazing, like the kindness of strangers. Oh, it's so lovely to hear you talking about that. And also over the last couple of days, telling us the stories along the way. One of my favourites is, didn't you bump into a fan of the Tough Girl podcast? Oh, uh, yes, I did. No, well, actually, um, do you mean Stan the Man? 
Stan the Man. Stan the Man. Yeah, he was actually, no, he was um, not the podcast. He liked the vlogs. And we were crossing the road. And he was like, hey, are you Sarah Williams? And I was like, oh, my goodness. It's so exciting. But he had like a Snickers for me and a Gatorade. Um, and he'd been following along my journey. And obviously, because I wasn't wearing a tracker and, and some of the vlogs were sort of time delayed, he didn't, didn't know exactly where I was going to be. But he heads out, I think, most weekends and gives trail magic to hikers. Um, which is obviously, you know, in, in, incredible. So, yeah, you, do, you just get to meet just amazing people. It is really incredible to hear about the kindness of, of people and giving you food along the way when you were running out. And that's really lovely to hear that people are genuinely that nice. Yeah. And so just back to sort of some of the key milestones. How did you feel when you got to, because you got to the halfway point, what day were you on then? So, there's almost like there's almost like two halfway points if that makes sense you've got like Harper's Ferry which is like almost like the psychological halfway point which is 1023 miles and then obviously you've got the actual halfway point but so I got to I think yeah I got to a thousand miles on day 50 and I ended up walking just shy of 30 miles that day to get myself into Harper's Ferry but then I was sort of I was broken I, I know I use this word quite often, but I was just so tired and exhausted and run down. And really, like, I I hadn't had, like, I think my lowest day in the past sort of 12 days was, like, less than 10 miles. But other than that, it's always been, in, you know, in double figures. And so I was just so, so super tired. I just needed a break. So on day 51, I did actually take a zero. And actually, I hadn't had a zero day since day eight. And those are my only two zero days. Um so that's quite extreme, I think. <laughs> and then how did you feel you were getting on? Because did it concern you? Because you're a bit, you're about a few days behind by that point, halfway through the challenge. Yeah, it, it did actually. I think for me as well, I was thinking, you know, okay, I've done a thousand miles in 50 days, which is amazing. But actually, I've still got to do another thousand miles plus another, the, the extra 190 in the same amount of time. So I've got to do extra miles in the same amount of time. I was also starting to get a lot weaker and I was starting to lose a lot of weight. And I think it was just everything was just starting to to run down on me. I actually remember writing like a Facebook post um, about, you know, basically saying, guys, you know, I'm I'm trying my best, uh, but I actually don't know how I'm going to do this because I was very aware that I had you know, the smoke, uh, the the whites coming up, the white mountains, and that I wouldn't be able to bash out um, as many miles as I wanted to, and it was going to be even harder for me physically to to complete the challenge. And I think mentally, I was just getting more and more down on myself, not knowing how this was even going to be possible so I remember I mean I do remember having you know a Skype call with you and having a pep talk with you and but it was it was just emotional but I think what I was doing I was I was thinking too big a picture almost and I was thinking you know to the end of the challenge whereas actually what I had to do was I just needed to focus on every single day and just try and do whatever I could each day and sometimes just try and push it just a little bit more. So I think at the halfway point, I needed to average another 24.4 miles every single day. So I'd always be aiming to try and do at least 25, if not a little bit more, just to try and um, give me a little bit of headway, um, especially for getting through the White Mountains. But uh, I, yeah, I started to feel the pressure because it changes, I think, after day 50. It suddenly it's like a countdown from day 50. I was also very aware that um, I knew, I was hoping that maybe, you know, the last 10 days I might get more of this, you know, like a second wind or the sprint finish coming through. But it was, there was going to be this section in the middle where it's almost like no man's land where I still had a really, really long way to go and I still had miles to tick off, but I wasn't, I wouldn't be seen to myself in making that much progress. So you touched on it there, but some of the vlogs are quite emotional. I know that when I was watching one with mum, we both had tears in our eyes watching you fall over and um, and you have mud on your face and we just thought, oh, just our hearts went out to, out to you. And obviously you're on your own. How did you actually get through those emotional experiences? So I, do, I know the, the, the video that you're talking about and um, 
it's one of those really strange things. Like you, like I film bits of it, but the, I suppose the bits that you don't see are I maybe film like a couple of minutes, but sometimes there will be like 10 minutes between each one, each little section of just being sat on the trail. But it really does actually come down to it. It's like, well, I am actually in the middle of nowhere. I have to get up. I have to keep walking. I have just got to, you know, I've got to look out for myself. I've got to be practical. I've got to be sensible. I've got to, you know, unfortunately suck it up, even if it is going to be painful because there's nobody else around. And, you know, I've got to take full responsibility for me and looking out, you know, for myself. Um, But yeah, there was these emotional emotional high points and emotional low points I one of the things I wanted to do and one of the reasons that I filmed for the vlog um, and have the daily vlog coming out is actually so people can see what it's actually like because I'm not sure if hike you know hiking can be glamorized and going on adventures can be glamorous and I know that there might be people out there thinking oh Sarah's had this amazing three-month holiday she's been out in nature for the past hundred odd days you know she's been traveling through the estates and it's all wonderful and actually sometimes you you want to be realistic and say you know this was one of the most physical challenge physical and mental challenges I've ever undertaken I really did put myself through the ringer Um, and by the way I should possibly say you know I it was my choice my decision to do the challenge in 100 days you know nobody else's um but it was not um it was not an easy thing to do and I suppose that's but this is why you do challenges. This is why you push yourself so you can really actually learn and say, well, why did you keep going? Why did you keep moving forward? What drove you? And um, yeah, it's just sort of quite a, a fascinating process, really. But it, yeah, there were some emotional moments. There's more emotional moments to come if you haven't watched the vlog. Because the last, the last three or four days of the hike, I was just pretty much in tears a lot of the time. It was just, yeah, very emotional. But talk me through what was going on in your head throughout the challenge. Like, how did you keep yourself motivated to keep going and bashing out that massive mileage every single day? Yeah, it's really, I mean, I think I'm a very self-motivated individual anyway. And I think I'm also very focused and just very aware of what I need to do and what I need to achieve. Some days when I was having like really bad days, it was a quite, well, Sometimes it was a case of not thinking about it, as in, don't even think, don't even think about it, just, just put your shoes on, don't think about anything else, just put your shoes on, okay, your, your shoes are on, okay, just put your backpack on, okay, just find the first blaze, find the second blaze. Sometimes I resorted to gratitude, and every time I saw a white blaze on the trail, I'd have to say, you know, what I was grateful for. I was also, I, th- I think breaking it down, trying not to think about the future too much, and just really narrowing my focus just to that day, just to that hour, just to that mile, to to get through it and I think my motivation has always been strong I'd say I don't think I ever not lacked motivation I was always motivated because and also I knew I had to get to the finish I knew I had to get to I knew I had to get to the end um I always don't know where that comes from Mm -hmm. what did you have a mantra that you used I had various mantras which would, you know, which would pop into my head and it would be like, you know, keep on walking, keep on walking, just, you know, move forward, move forward, move forward, you know, keep on making progress, keep on making progress. Um, I would do things as well, like counting a lot of times. Sometimes if, um, if I needed to get out of my head, I'd be listening to podcasts, I'd be listening to music. I'd also sometimes run, you know, like ask myself like ridiculous questions. You know, what would you do if you won five million pounds? How would you spend it? Um, I do pretend interviews, you know, like I was on like the Ellen DeGeneres show and like what questions Ellen would ask me and how I'd answer them. And, and you would be surprised about how much time that can actually um, take up. And also I think, Sometimes just thinking about I me, mean, one of the things I wanted to do on the trail was actually to think about life. And I know that sounds wishy washy, but really to think about the decisions that I've made in the past. You know, I want to think about my future. I wanted to think about Tough Girl Challenge. I wanted to think about the tribe. I wanted to think about decisions that I've made, you know, what I've, what I've learned, you know, the good things and the bad things. And just to really reevaluate me and just spend time getting I mean I think I know myself really well anyway but I just wanted to just go that little bit deeper and just really take that time out and that's what I would do 
um, every morning generally when I started walking that I I wouldn't listen to my music or podcast until at least after 12 o'clock. The only time that that changed was when I had some like massive hills at the very start or I was really struggling and I just needed to get out of my own head. Um, that's when I'd, I'd put the music on really, really loud and um, yeah, just just get moving. Just go for it. Yeah, just keep literally, sometimes it was just keep putting one step in front of the other. Just get to the next tree, get to the next boulder, get to the next place. Now we're going to move on to the quick fire round because basically there are so many questions from the Tough Girl tribe that I thought this might be quite a good way to break the interview up a little bit. So are you ready? I'm ready. What's your What's your trail name? Tough. Woohoo! Best animal? Baby bears. Best view? McAfee knob. Did you ever feel scared out there on your own? No. What did you miss the most? Flushing toilets. What invention of modern society did you miss the most? Oh, flushing toilets. <laughs> what did you think you missed but you didn't miss at all? Uh, I don't know. Uh, say it again. What did, what, I... did, what did you think you would miss, yes. like hair straighteners, but you didn't miss them at all? But we can move on from this one if you want. Uh, I literally can't think of anything. Have you become zen about rocks? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> what was the one thought that kept you going? Meeting mum and well, meeting you two, meeting you and mum in um, in Boston. Ah, that's lovely. What was your biggest culture shock? No, no real culture shock. Did you enjoy the solitude, or did you find it challenging? enjoyed the solitude has it been life-changing I don't know did you ever feel bored no would you like to hike or run any other trails in the world not at this moment in time but maybe (laughs) (laughs) will you ever eat another Snickers bar again oh yes I love Snickers (laughs) it was an ice cream even better final final question in the quick fire round would you do it again no. <laughs> As expected. It's, maybe it's like a marathon where you get to the end and you're like, never again. E- no, I think this is a, I've done this now. There's so many more adventures and challenges out in the world that, um, yeah, I wouldn't do it again. So one thing we haven't talked about yet is your food situation. Now, you are a generally a super healthy, you're a super fit person, What was it like having to consume sort of 6,000 calories every day? What kind of foods were you eating and and how's that sort of changed over the 100 days? Do you know, I'd say this this is one of the hardest things that I actually had to cope with was the food because I don't know if I was being naive when I started out but I sort of imagined I even even wrote down like all the foods that I'd be eating you know it would be all the nuts um, and the high protein foods and just still being able to be healthy, you know, in quotations on the trail. And, you know, I drink water normally, like I don't drink soda, I don't drink coffee, I don't drink tea. And so I generally, I'm happy drinking just plain old water, maybe with some lemons in. But when I was on the trail, trying to consume that many calories from uh, from like healthy, in quotation marks, is just one of the most challenging things ever. And basically, my diet massively, massively changed. The other thing you've got to remember is I was actually doing it stoveless as well. So I wasn't actually having any cooked food. So it was basically, there was a lot of, a lot of bars, like, you know, protein bars and cliff bars and just generally just eating food, which I would never normally consume. And actually, it did, it did really start to get me down. I could, that I was, slamming down thousands and thousands of calories every day and it wasn't making even a dent into my weight loss so I was, I actually put on um put on weight for the start so I weighed like 10 stone 8 and uh, I think by the end of it I was under 9 stone so I possibly lost like about 2 2 stone doing this and obviously you know I've started to put weight on now and you can actually see from even the start of my videos to the very very when you see the last there's some where I just look horrendous. I'm just so skeletal uh, towards the end. And everyone's telling me, oh, you need to eat more, you need to eat more. 
And it's like I I was spending, I'd say every four days, about $100, if not more, on food. And I just could not consume enough calories. And also like trying to carry them as well. It was, that was actually one of the hardest things. I think the next hardest challenge is actually going to be changing my diet back to, you know, healthy eating and not being able to slam down Snickers you know, I was having like two, well, I think on one day I had like four Snickers for breakfast, but there's a thousand calories. So, um, yeah, the food situation was very challenging for me, but sometimes you've actually just got to be kind to yourself and just think, you know what, your body is needing this. You're just burning so much every single day that actually you need to eat whatever you can get your hands on. The other thing, I think the other issue that I was, that I had or not had was that I was doing my resupply from, I wasn't going off trail or I very rarely went off trail. Um, so I was getting resupply from the towns that I was going through or the garages. And so generally you just buy whatever you can buy in the, in the garage. So whether it is cookies or protein bars or sweets or you know dried meats or whatever it is, you just buy what you could buy, um, carry as much as you can and eat as much as you can when you're in the towns. Well, it sounds like you did what you had to do at the time, but now you're ready to get back to your normal, healthy lifestyle. Yeah, I think so. I think, yeah, I I am just, yeah, I was actually towards the end. I was dreaming about, this sounds ridiculous. I was dreaming about like kale and lemon water and just green smoothies and vegetables because I don't think I really ate ate vegetables throughout the whole, throughout the whole trip. And sometimes some of the towns that you're going through, all they have is... Um, processed foods so there's no it wasn't that easy because you know sometimes as well you just want like a burger or a pizza and it wasn't easy to get like a piece of salmon and vegetables or anything and also to be honest at that point I need to be getting down so many calories that actually a piece of salmon and vegetables just wasn't going to cut it it's like I needed (laughs) burger chips coke drinks ice cream just anything with calories in talk to me about some of the inspiring people you met along the way yeah so I bumped into one guy um called Pat I think his name was and he actually started walking down in Florida and he did that I can't remember the name of the Florida trail but it connects up with the Appalachian Trail he's on the Appalachian Trail he's going to carry on the Appalachian Trail and carry on all the way up to Canada and that was amazing I also met you know this group of um group of women who'd been section hiking the trail and they've been doing it um you know over 12 years which is amazing so it was just there was just so many women of all different ages out on the trail the youngest I met was I think about 12 years old and she was out there with her father doing a through well not doing a through hike just doing a section hike over over the holidays but also meeting women who were in their 60s and 70s out on the trail and that for me was just inspiring. I mean, I, I do remember at one point I just crossed over a river, like you know, it was bounded over this river, which you know had these rocks, and so maybe like twenty meter river with rocks. You just hop on all the rocks, hop over. It took me maybe a minute. Got to the other side, was filtering my water. Bumped into this other lady, and I watched her, and it possibly took her about five minutes to cross this river. You know, she was having to sit on the rocks, and she was getting her feet wet, and you know, using all different tactics and. And you know, you're just watching and you're just like, oh my goodness, wow. Like, I've just got no idea how she's, how she's doing it. And it's, it is like massively inspiring. And everybody's out on the trail for, for different reasons. You know, whether it's a personal challenge, whether it's getting over a heartbreak or, you know, something along those lines, or they just quit their job. <laughs> Quite a lot of people who quit their job actually were just like, yeah, I just wanted to do something completely crazy. And I think that was, that was inspiring really, just seeing like all these, everyday women just out there living their dreams and living their life oh that I mean that does sound massively inspiring it's kind of like watching the marathon and you just see people of all ages and all shapes of shapes and sizes just taking one step at a time it's incredible yeah absolutely so talk me through some of the other milestones like how did it feel moving from one state to the next state uh it was it was pretty cool actually at the start I think when the first time I crossed over from Georgia into North Carolina and I think it was 75 miles in you're like oh my you actually felt like you were making progress I think one of the hardest bits was like Virginia so Virginia is like maybe like 500 miles or something and everybody else thinks like Virginia goes on forever and ever and I, I think I ended up doing it relatively quickly but it was just it was just a case of another state down 13 to go um crossing over 
where did I cross over? Yeah, crossing over in New York into, um, no, sorry, Pennsylvania into New Jersey. That was exciting because you're on this massive road and it was like Pennsylvania and the rocks. It was like saying goodbye to the rocks and just moving into New Jersey. That was amazing because when you look on a map, if you actually sort of um, look at how far it is, I mean, that was sometimes was one of the most demoralizing things when you you'd look at a map on a wall in a hostel and you'd sort of see how far you'd walk and see how far you had to go. It was just... Um, it was just crazy, but every every state was um, was amazing. Even getting into Maine, it was like, oh my goodness, you know, wow, how have I made it to the fourteenth and final state? It was just, I suppose, it's another way of breaking down the challenge. So you could break down the challenge into states, you could break it down into into miles, um, and yeah, it, it was it was just another sense of achievement every time you could tick that box. Let's move on a little bit and talk about some of your lowest moments and how you actually overcame them. Have you got some examples? Oh, so many. Um, I think one of the toughest things or one of the things that I hated the most and probably ever really hate. So for me personally, I hate being cold and I hate being wet. It's like two of my most miserable things and combine them together. And there are a couple of days where I'd, I basically, well, one day I'd end up walking uh, for about six hours in the pouring rain getting to the shelter and it was fine I got dry then the following morning it was another 12 hours of sort of rain and it's when your feet are wet your hands are wet and my feet were starting to disintegrate my hands you know when you go in a bathtub for quite a long time and your and your fingers get all that wrinkled um that was what was happening to my feet and my hands I was having trouble gripping my poles and when you're just completely wet it's just the most miserable thing ever um so I had a couple of those days the other low point I think for me would um oh by the way to get over that you it sounds awful but you really really just can't get over it you just have to suck it up and just put your wet socks on put your wet shoes on just get moving and after about 10 minutes you're fine because you're warmed up you're moving forward and 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 you just know you just have to be brave for those initial few minutes I think the other time that I was very very uh low I would say was when I was having to sleep at really really high altitude and I tried to this was in the White Mountains and I tried to stay at one of the huts and they were basically like no we're fully booked there's no room but the camp there's a there's a campground two and a half miles away and it's you know just like I've just walked 24 miles to get here I'm not sure I've got another two and a half miles over this terrain I don't think I've got it in me so a couple of the other hikers were like oh we're just going to wild camp a little bit Um, a little bit uh, higher up and this may be about three and a half thousand oh it's not meters but the elevation and um and I was just thinking to myself I don't I don't think I've got the right equipment for this as in I just don't have enough warm clothing because I'm just so ultra lightweight so I have my thermo rest I've got my sleeping bag which is great for lower elevation but it is a very very lightweight sleeping bag and um that sort of that I suppose concerned me but it was almost a case of there's nothing you can do so I wore everything I owned I was sleeping in everything and it was just a question of just getting through the night and then waking up early and just getting moving and sometimes there's just there's just nothing you can do and you have no control over over the elements uh what's happening outside but you do have the control over you and your internalness and how you feel and sometimes it was just a question of just embracing what was happening and just embracing the suck really and just be like you know what it's not all unicorns sunshine and roses some days it's going to be cold wet and miserable and you're going to feel miserable but those are the days that you don't quit but you have to just suck up suck it up and just carry on and and I'm I'm not sure that even to say like suck it up helps people but sometimes you have to realize it's just it's going to be hard. It's going to challenge you. And those are the situations that do make you stronger. And so I do remember as well, like I think I was on my way to Harper's Ferry and my hands had basically disintegrated because they'd been wet for so long and they were just so, so painful. But I got through it. And then two weeks later, when the same thing happened, I knew that my hands were going to get destroyed. And I was like, well, you've already dealt with this previously. You know, it's going to be painful. It is what it is. And actually, because I'd already been through it, that helped me get through you know, having wet hands again and having to deal with with the pain of the, with the pain of that. So, um, I think you just learn from those situations, and it's and sometimes you can actually make it worse by how you're thinking about it. So sometimes you do need to try and put a positive spin on it, as hard as that may be, and just try and look for the positivity and just try and 
sometimes just force yourself to smile. <laughs> that brings me on to the next question. Was there any point where you seriously questioned why you were doing the hike to the, the point where you thought you might actually even pack it in? Uh, I would never, I would never quit. Like I would never, ever stop unless I got injured. But I think the one point where I was scared I think is the only way to describe it is when I was in the in the White Mountains and I decided to push on and do like an extra four miles and I'd got to the top of one of these mountains and it was pitch black and my head torch was completely rubbish the fog was starting to come in there was very few blazes to follow and when you get to the top of some of the mountains they have like the cairns so you know the rock piles and it was getting to the point where I couldn't see the next rock pile I couldn't see the next blaze I couldn't see the direction I was going in the fog was coming in and I was just very very conscious that I was you know exposed to all the elements and that I had to be very very careful of things like foot placement and not getting lost and just that for me was pretty horrendous to be honest and I still remember saying to myself just keep calm keep calm keep focus just focus find the next you know the next point the next can the next blaze and just keep moving forward and and sometimes when you're on these really exposed rock faces I mean I do I do remember I was climbing up this this sometimes the only way to describe it's like a sheer wall and but on on the right hand side they had all these branches and I remember you know I was I was pulling myself up on one of the branches. The branches sort of, get, you know, gave way. It wasn't as sturdy as I was expecting. But obviously, instead of, like, falling back, I was, like, you know, made myself fall forward into the rock face, slammed the rock face quite hard, and my GoPro fell out. So this is in you know, the middle of the night. I'm standing on this massive rock, um, falling forward. A GoPro's, my GoPro's fallen. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, that's like three weeks footage. So I was having to take my backpack off, use, starting to use my iPhone for light. And I could see the GoPro was basically down in like the rock cavern below me. And I could see that I, could cl- I couldn't reach it by putting my hand in. I'd have to climb down there to get it out. Because then you start thinking, okay, is this a sensible decision to be making? Do I, you know, can I climb down? If I climb down, can I get out again? And you sort of, that you're weighing all these things up and it's pitch black and you, I climbed down. Obviously, I did get my GoPro, climb back out again, putting my rucksack back on my back on this sort of ledge. And you sometimes at that point, you're thinking, what am I doing? Because there are certain parts of the Appalachian Trail where I honestly feel as though people are just splash paint on rocks <laughs> in like any which direction. And I have come to certain rock faces and I've just thought I have no idea how I'm going to get past this or get over this or get through it or get around it. I just couldn't see the the way. And yeah, it's I mean, you, you always can find a way. There's always there is always a solution to the problem at hand. But when you face that time after time after time, it can actually be like a little bit demoralizing. But I would. I would never, I never once wanted to quit, but there have been times where I've been utterly miserable. And I think there's this great video post of me coming up, like sat in the rain, soaking wet, just eating a protein bar, just getting rained on um, and just feeling miserable and downtrodden. But it's just embracing the suck and just sucking it up and just thinking, do you know what? Just got to get through this. Just, just get through this next section. I mean, to me, it doesn't sound exactly like a walk in a park. Was it as tough as you were expecting or was it tougher? I knew there was going to be tough sections. I don't think I expected as much sort of like scrambling and climbing up like sheer rock faces. And sometimes you're on these tiny little ledges. And um, and sometimes I just felt very exposed and just thought, I do not feel safe here. I think partly because, you know, have, carrying the heavy backpack on, not necessarily having the right, uh, you know, when you have, you're you used to when you've got your balance and having my balance off because of my backpack, my backpack. Um, it, yeah, certain sections I just wasn't expecting it to be as brutal as it was. But it also made me think as, you know, I, I am strong, fit and healthy. And I was struggling with some of these sections. And I just don't know how other 
individuals especially if they're you know much older like if you're in your 70s I just don't know how people have done it and even like some of um, if you're much shorter like I just don't know how people would get themselves up the rocks you know it was just um but you know thousands of people do do this trail every every year so I think that's one of the reasons I'm actually so pleased that I have actually vlogged it so I can look back and remember some of those um some of those sections and 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 also sort of share it with other people so they can get like a realistic viewpoint of what the Appalachian Trail is because it's not just a it's not just a, a gentle walk through the woods there are some really you know tough tough sections so apart from finishing the actual Appalachian Trail, talk me through some of your highlights from the trail. Oh, that was, there was, God, there were so many. Um, I have to say, it was almost sometimes like reaching the top of mountains and looking out at the views and just knowing that you got yourself there. I think that was, that was totally amazing. I mean, the other highlights as well was reaching like the Kenbeck River and being sort of like ferried across in this little canoe. That was amazing. Sometimes it's, uh, well, I found this quite funny, but I'd, um, so in the White Mountains, I'd reached this, I'd reached this one hut and it said it was like eight hours, 50 minutes to the next hut. And I remember, I don't know what it was. I just, I was just, in this phenomenal mood I had this music playing it was super loud and certain stretches I was able to run like the the gentle downhills I just felt incredible and I just smashed out this mileage through very tough terrain and I remember getting to this hut for like about seven o'clock and the food was still being served so I was able to go in sit down have this amazing meal and I remember getting outside and I was like vlogging. Oh, God, this would be a funny vlog. And I was just like, yes, like I'm an absolute machine. I've just smashed it and walked through, walked to the hut. And there was a group of like other three hikers there. And I was just like, yeah, you know, yay for me. And I, I feel amazing. And where's my round of applause and <laughs> um, you know, for, for doing that section. And so, but to be honest, like most of my highlights do actually come from it was actually like from the people, like, you know, meeting Sharon Pan and Barbara in New York State, spending time with Becca at Kingman's Dome, um, the individuals on the trail who who gave me trail magic or who cooked for me. The you know, I had this other other situation when um the final few days, uh, I was basically you know, running out, well, I'd actually sort of run out of food. I wasn't able to get, well, the final day, I wasn't able to get any food. Coming across this lady who I asked for food and she was like, oh my God, absolutely. And she just gave me this ton of food. And those are just amazing highlights. And people, you know, people who pick you up and, um, and give you a hitch and a ride into town. I remember one time I I got a hitch into town. I was sat outside the supermarket. The supermarket had free Wi-Fi. And I was basically having to psych myself up to, I don't really like hitch, uh, hitchhiking. Like I'm not a massive fan of it. I always feel very on edge and I'm very, very wary of, you know, who's, who's picking me up, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and this woman just walks over to me. It's like, oh, hey, you're a through hiker. And I'm like, yeah, she said, oh, do you need a lift back to the trail? And you're just like, yes, oh my goodness, I do. So I didn't even have to hitchhike. You had people coming up to you and offering to, to drive you, you know, drive you to the trailhead. So yeah, just tons and tons of um of highlights and actually sometimes the highlights was you know like getting my messages like being able to connect to wi-fi and see who's messaged me on whatsapp or have a look in the tough girl tribe and see what everybody else had been doing and accomplishing you know over the summer months and you know sometimes i wouldn't be able to reply to them all but i'd, I'd read what they were achieving it would be like oh that and that was inspiring to me as well that there were all these incredible women out there who were doing all these things and I I talked about doing this like 100 day challenge so everybody in the tribe could pick one thing that they could do for 100 days and then I think of those women who were doing their 100 day challenge who'd be thinking of me and I'm thinking of them so it's almost like it's just like this motivation which is going like back and forth um but yeah and just everyone like, is inspiring everyone else exactly these map, massive like ripple effects and you know I, obviously you know I, I did think a lot about family when I was over there and, and you guys and your voices would be in my head you know what would Caroline do <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know if I was ever not sure or you know what would dad say to me in this situation or you know, especially if I was feeling low or what would mum say and th- th- those words would pop into my head and, and that was inspiring well, I did love that you managed to stop off and get a manicure along the way. 
Yeah, that just that just did work out. Actually, worked out really well. I got this. Um, I think it was like a holiday in, and they had like a swimming pool as well. So I did my resupply, and it was like six dollars to have my nails painted. And I just thought, you know what? I just need a bit of TLC, and uh, yeah, that was really fun. <laughs> Absolutely, and they look good for a few days on the vlog as well. Yeah. What was your most memorable favorite moment receiving trail magic? Because I've loved hearing all, all your stories about trail magic and how kind people are. So what's been your favorite moment? Oh, there was possibly one where um I was I was coming down this big, big mountain and every person I passed was like, Oh, there's trail magic or there's trail magic, but I was like two miles away. And um and sometimes you don't know like if it's still gonna be there. It'd been raining all day. And I eventually got to this road and I was like, where's the trail magic? And I could see the car and they basically packed everything up. So I like ran over and I was like, no, I need trail magic. And um, so she was like, here you go, here you go. It's like, here's like a cupcake. So, but they had like a whole tray of them. So I pretty much smashed down four cupcakes. I don't think, I think they sort of stood there in shock watching me because I slammed down like four cupcakes. She was like, oh, do you need anything else? And I was like, oh, I'll take a few more. And I got some like hot dog buns to take with me. And um, I think they were just basically like staring at me like, who is this wild, smelly, slightly deranged woman with crazy hair, like just slamming down cupcakes. Uh, but to us, like, all the trail magic was 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 just amazing like people who cooked you beef burgers um on the trail i missed out on, so there is actually this man he's called the omelet man and he basically uh, he sets up like an omelet stand and makes omelets for hikers and i missed it by like 10 minutes so stuff like that can be pretty gutting so one of the things that i really enjoyed was was there an actual cat walking the trail oh uh, no we well yes and no really so um so I met a father with his two children. So the father was called Taco, the daughter was called Songbird, and I can't remember what the son's name was. And they had brought a cat with them, a Coyote, um, who was called Oti. It was just like this glorious little cat. And occasionally he'd walk like little bits of the trail, but generally he'd just sit on top of um, of one of their backpacks and sort of sleep for most of the day. But it was just really lovely. Although I do remember one time I was, they were all sleeping in the shelter and I had my tent up. And sometimes on the tent, um, you can get like wet leaves attached to, to it. And so I would just flick it from the inside. And there was this like sort of dark little... Um, a uh, thing on my on the outside of the tent and I was in inside my tent I just sort of flicked it and it was the cat's paw <laughs> and so obviously the cat let out a scream I let out a scream and this cat was like running off um but yeah like, the cat it was amazing actually and also the dogs on the trail I absolutely love seeing all these incredible dogs some of the dogs looked so happy they were just like having the time of their life and you could see that they were just enjoying every second and then other dogs their owners like yes they're absolutely loving it and you look at the dog's face and think no they're not they are hating this this is a miserable experience for them but yeah like seeing seeing the animals on the trail was really really nice oh what about seeing the bears on the trail and the other than the snakes oh that was all in one day you yeah your first thought is like I saw this baby bear climbing a tree. This was maybe about six forty in the morning because I'd set off really early. I was going to have a really good day, good really good day, lots of good mileage. Saw a baby bear climbing a tree, and when you first see like a baby bear, your first thought is, "Oh, it's so cute," and then it's quickly followed followed by, "Where is the mama bear? Where is mummy bear?" And basically, mama bear like stood up, and it was like, "Okay, I am." And it was, you know, five meters from the path, so you're having to like back away. And I was banging my banging my poles together, making a noise, but just backing off slowly. And then um, I'd go forward again, and then I saw a second baby bear. So there's two, excuse me, there's two baby cubs climbing the tree. There's mama bear in front of it, not moving. You know, totally, her, totally her right. So I spent the next sort of ten, fifteen minutes, basically. Give them space, walking forward, walking back, walking forward. And eventually, um, they'd sort of left. So I sort of ran, you know, got past there pretty quickly and then coming past the snake. Um, but it is amazing. Like once you've dealt with it once, then you almost become not, not immune. That sounds ridiculous, but you almost become, you always have more confidence in yourself and how to deal with it. And you're just like, okay, this is the best. What I need to do is need to be chilled. And the snake, and I just don't really like the snakes and stuff like that. So you're just like, Ugh. um, but generally, like that was, uh, yeah, that was like all of the main wildlife that I saw, really. I saw lots of deer. That was really cute. And baby deer, they were really, really sweet. Um, it was nice seeing them. But I actually really only saw the 
sort of bears I'd say in the first sort of thousand odd miles and after that I, I didn't really see anything in the final final four or five states. I remember before you left, you came up with your what if list. Do you want to just tell everyone a little bit about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. So this is part of my mental preparation and mental training. And what you do is it's while you're in a nice, comfortable, safe environment, you sit down and go through everything that could potentially go wrong or, you know, what could happen on the application trail. And generally, you know, you're not going to think of everything, but you can write down certain things, you know, what are you going to happen if your kit gets stolen, what happens if you don't have enough food? What happens if you run out of water? What happens if your seam bag gets wet? What happens um, if, you, if, if you hurt yourself? What happens if you get the tummy bug? Or if you, what if you don't like it? And then you write down, so if you basically get a piece of paper, split it in two, you write down all the what ifs on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, you go through and think about in your nice, comfortable, safe environment, all potential solutions. And I got the tribe involved and got them to, you know, ask, you know, what potential what ifs I'd have to deal with. And it's actually quite a good exercise to deal with because you can think through all the different solutions. And then it just means that when it does happen to you on the trail, you've actually already thought about it and thought, okay, well, I did think this could happen. I didn't want it to happen, but this is how I can handle the situation instead of having to face something for the first time. I mean, you can't prepare for everything, but that's part of the the reasons that you do adventures and do challenges is to experience these um, these new situations. So yes, yeah, so I've got this massive list of of various things. You know, what happens if you lose your eating utensils, and you know, what I do about it, and and for a couple of them, um, they, yeah, they worked out and stuff which I thought would never happen. Like, you know, what happens if you run out of food? I was thinking, well, if I run out of food, then that is bad planning on my behalf. And actually it happens so many times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you do, you do sort of learn, learn from it. And obviously on that what if list you, you had about what you'd, what to do if you bumped into a bear. Yeah, because I, I had like a number, I think my, a couple of, I think I had like four main fears is one is getting cold and wet two was bears the third one was like lightning and I can't remember what the fourth one was but basically for bears it's like you know follow all the advice you know make sure you hang your bear bag up just be vigilant make noise when you're walking um don't approach bears and just be respectful of them and, and their environment so just moving on a little bit tell me about some of the best decisions you actually made on the trial one of the best things I made is I'd um I'd had to wrap my tent up or in the morning it'd been raining. I'd wrap my tent up. So that was, you know, that was sort of all damp. Um, everything's, you know, and everything is just damp. And I was thinking, if I don't dry this out, I'm not going to be able to wild camp this evening. And there's no sort of shelters along the way. Luckily, it was like a super sunny day. And I basically stopped at about 1.30 by the side of a road, just got all of my equipment out, just got everything dried. And that was happens to be one of my best decisions because that allowed me then to walk a lot later um it also allowed me to wild camp so super happy with that the other the only sort of time issue I had was actually crossing the river so the Kenbeck river where you have to take this canoe across and they provide like this sort of ferry service and my book had said that the ferry service ran from 9 to 11 and 2 till 4 or something but as I got closer and closer the signs basically said the ferry service only ran from 12 till 2 so it's a very small window so if I missed that window I would have missed my opportunity to cross the river and that meant that I ended up having to do this like 30 mile day the day before in order that I could do the mileage to get to the ferry service by at least 1 30 so doing that and having those situations does put you in in a good in a good stead I think the other main decision which was one of my best decisions even though it cost me a ridiculous amount of money was um when I was in the White Mountains staying at one of the huts so they have um they have this mountaineering club and they have a system of huts and the prices are expensive because everything gets packed in and packed out and I just knew that I could not sleep at high high elevation because I would just get too cold and I needed to get food and this was just before the presidential range it's really quite tough like 12 miles a stunning 12 miles and so I ended up staying at this hut and but to be honest it worked out incredibly well because I got there late at night I managed to get you know a full-on dinner really really well fed I had a good night's sleep I was nice and warm the following morning we were up early had a full-on breakfast and I was able to start my day just 
refreshed and recharged. It was almost like, you know, like a Nero day for me. And I think that allowed me to get through the next couple of, of challenging days because if I had to sleep outside, I would have had to carry more food. I wouldn't have had like an amazing breakfast, an amazing dinner to like refuel me. So that was, you know, another or a decision that I was pleased with that I made. What about the worst decision you've made? Uh, the worst decision. What was the bad decision I made? Bad decision. Bad decision. Uh, I don't. Have you got any examples where you think I made a bad decision? <laughs> I <laughs> well, I probably would just say, um, you know, one of the things that me and Dad pointed out when we were watching the YouTube videos is you kept saying every day, you know, I really need to be getting up earlier and earlier. And me and Dad were like, should be up at six a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it's really, it's weird that like, you do say that, but. It was actually sometimes it was just a struggle to get up that early in the morning. I just realized like I'm not a morning person. But did I make any? It was obviously you needed just sort of 12 hours sleep yeah. in order to like help your body to rest and recover. Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's any cross things that I did or did I put myself? I mean, I suppose the only potentially bad decision that I did make was um, deciding to do this extra four miles in the White Mountains. I, pos- I possibly shouldn't have done that. Um, but it did get me to the next shelter and the next accommodation. When, uh, so it all happened for a reason. Yeah, like I do think everything does happen for a reason and the world is working for you, not against you. Yeah, that, I don't know if that's wrong. That I can't think, I, yeah, I literally can't think of any bad decisions that I made. Uh, I, I probably have made bad decisions, but... Maybe I just don't view them in that way. Absolutely. It's because your positive mental attitude throughout <laughs> your challenge. Exactly. One of my favorite questions from some from from one of the girl, one of the tough girls is tell us about blister watch. How are your feet doing? Uh do you know my feet are absolutely it's weird. It's almost like they're completely numb. So that they are actually fine. Like they're just really, really hard. They're just really hard now and they think they've grown and expanded a lot. Um but no, the feet are fine. It's it's like once you've like sat on your hand and then, you know, when your hand starts coming back to life, you get all those pins and needles. I think that's what I'm going through at the moment is just the feet trying to get. Because my feet used to be so, like, sounds great, but so lovely and like soft and supple and just really, really nice. And now they're basically just rock solid. Um, but generally pretty, pretty good. I mean, I didn't know what state my feet were going to be in we're going to be in and generally like the first blisters that I got initially like compete is just amazing I recommend that to everybody they help my blisters so much the reason I got those blisters was you know walking for 12 hours with wet feet and also some of it's a sideways motion that I seem to get blisters on like on the sides of my heels it's never um anywhere else like I did at one point thought I was getting like these internal blisters at the bottom of my feet going up but I think that was just from all of the rocks um but yeah, no, feet, feet are good. Feet are strong. Fantastic. And talking of rocks, were you expecting quite as many rocks as there actually were? Yeah, I, I knew it was. I knew it was going to be rocky. I just don't think I realised like the damage it would be doing to my like. It was just. It just felt like my feet were just being bruised constantly, and it's just quite demoralising. I think facing these rocks, and I mean, and I, you got to remember as well. I'm doing it really quickly in comparison to most people if I had weeks and weeks and weeks of the rocks I could see why people might want to quit because it is just it sucks the life out of you just um yeah just walking on the rocks if we if we fast forward to sort of the last week of the challenge and I know from talking to you in the last few days that this has been the most probably emotional part of the journey and there were probably some tears every single day how was that last week of the challenge well do you know I think what's interesting is everybody had told me about the 100 mile wilderness and that it was fast and it was flat and so in my head I thought the last week was going to be really enjoyable that I was going to get onto this fast flat um, 100 mile wilderness bash it out over two or three days it was going to be nice walking not that rocky not that many climbs and it was just brutal I mean I think I remember I was walking I was walking uh, from like seven in the morning till maybe seven o'clock at night eight o'clock at night 
and I did like 28 miles and this was on day 95. The following day I walked the same length of time. So from seven in the morning to about seven or eight o'clock at night, 24 miles. The third day, 21 miles. So I was basically still doing the exact same amount of time, but I was just getting less and less and less miles in. And that was just hugely, hugely demoralizing. And um, so 28 miles, so 24 miles, so 21 miles leaving me with about 70 odd miles to get to Katahdin. So I had two days, one day of 30 odd miles and the and the 99th day I had 33 miles to do. And I was night hiking to about 11 o'clock at night. But it, at that point, it was just a case of doing what I had to do. I was also getting very concerned about the weather because the weather I wasn't expecting, especially over the last two weeks, the weather to change as much as it did. And obviously, we were going into fall, so going into autumn, and the leaves were changing. It was beautiful and amazing to see, but I was expecting it still to be, you know, relatively warm. But it was getting to the point where I was just so cold all the time, and I couldn't get warm, and it was starting to to affect me like quite emotionally. So there was lots and lots of lots and lots and lots of tears, and. Um, it was just, I it almost got to the point where I wasn't even thinking about it anymore. It was just like, just keep walking. You've just got to get. So on the 99th day, I had to get to this, this bridge basically, because I knew then I'd have to walk 10 miles to get to another campsite before I started the climb to Katahdin. And because it was in September, they basically recommend that you start walking to climb Katahdin by 10 o'clock. So I knew I had to do 10 miles by 10 o'clock. And I think I got there at 10.36. And I started my climb up to Katahdin at 10.46. So I was also very conscious of the turnaround time and basically having to get to the top, turn around safely and get back down to the bottom before it got dark. So it was almost like this, there was this constant time pressure on me. And um, yeah, so the the final day, it was quite weird. You know, I'd, I'd run out of food at this point. I had like one vegan meal, which was like 500 calories and a bag of uh, cold uh mashed potato which for some reason I added got garlic with it as well and I just <laughs> didn't even like the smell of it and I couldn't really eat it and so I was struggling for food I was just crying I was just crying all the time and I couldn't control myself and I couldn't understand why I couldn't stop crying um, but it was nice when I got to the ranger station I could drop my backpack off change it to a day pack and I was bounding like the first couple of miles I just did so so quickly because I was just flying along and then the real climbing started and began. And um, yeah, like a, a, Katahdin is like an amazing mountain to to summit. And I was actually very, very fortunate with the weather and that it was beautiful, you know, blue skies. It wasn't that windy when I started the climb. And I got to the summit about at about two o'clock and there was maybe just like a, a, a few other people around there at the same time as me. And it was strange. Like I, it wasn't like this. I randomly, this is like maybe like the only time that I didn't actually cry, like pretty much all the way up, I've been crying. But it just felt, I think I just felt like this massive weight lifting and this massive relief that, oh my goodness, I've actually done it. So I've walked 2,190 miles. I've made it from Springer Mountain, Georgia. I've reached the summit of Mount Katahdin on the 10th of September by two o'clock. And yeah, then all I had to contend with was, you know, the walk, the walk down. And um, yeah, the walk down, the wind started to get up. I was being blown a little bit diagonal. Didn't feel that safe on on the rocks. And um, but before the walk down, I'd actually been thinking to myself, "Do you know what would be amazing to help me with my climb? Is having a really good pair of gloves because my hands were being shredded from like gripping the rocks and you know trying to brace myself and pull myself up and push myself in these different." Um, positions and randomly at the top there was this pair of gloves just there and I asked around it's like oh are these anybody's gloves everyone's like no 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 so I was like brilliant the trail provides so I got these amazing grippy gloves to help me down and I got down and then um one of my next thoughts was um I was like oh I hope Jojo is going to be there so Jojo is a member of the of the tough girl tribe and she's one of the seven women seven challenges and months and months and months ago we, she basically offered to come and you know come and meet me and drive me to Boston, which I thought was just incredible. And over, I'd say the last two weeks, our, my focus was solely just on walking every single day. Like I don't think I even messaged or text you guys really, or text you know the family that much, just saying where I am and what I'm doing, because it was just all I was doing was walking, like walking, and sleeping. That's all I was doing. That's all I was focused on. And I think I'd managed to, the Wi-Fi was rubbish. So I managed to send Jojo like one email, just like, hey, <laughs> I hope we're still on for the 10th. And, da, 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 da. and um, 
it was quite, I remember vlogging as I was walking down, basically saying, oh, you know, I haven't really reconfirmed anything with Jojo. And I sort of, I hope she's going to be there. Um, you know, I sort of don't know if she, if she, if she is sort of thing because I haven't been in communication and I tried my phone because no one at this point knew that I'd completed it and I was wanted to message you to get you to tell the tribe and there was no signal. It was just like, oh. And as I was walking down, I literally finished doing this internal vlog, uh, internal chat to the, to the camera and then I saw Jojo walking up and that was just amazing. It was like, oh my goodness, this is actually happening. Jojo had bought me this incredible hamper filled with food there's this amazing like oh this chocolate cupcake and there was like a blanket and crisps and cookies and you know everything that you could possibly want to see once you finished a hike was there which was just ideal um and that and that was it really and then Jojo drove me um back to back to or down to Boston we had we stopped at a hotel on the way and then she drove me in on the morning and then I had one day in Boston before you guys arrived but yeah that was the that was the finish, but it doesn't, it feels, I don't know if it, it, I don't know if it's sunk in yet. It's almost quite weird. It's like, I can't really believe that I've done it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is one of those incredible things when you've got a massive, massive goals goal and you're taking one step every day, or obviously more like 22, 23 miles every yeah. single day towards it. And you have achieved it. And it is going to take a bit of time. It's like when you completed the Marathon de Sables and, you know, that took a while for it to actually sink in. But it is amazing. Are you missing the tri- trail? The trail? <sighs> no I think I was I was ready I was ready to finish like I was almost starting to get claustrophobic in the woods just being covered constantly by the trees and the branches it was just I think that's one of the reasons I like getting to the summit of you know, some of these mountains because you just had this f- like fresh air and freedom and I know that sounds very strange but I was I was ready to finish when I finished. And actually, I've got so much respect for people who are out there for five or six months or even longer, because I think mentally that is so tough. You know, I mean, I know I bashed through it really, really, really quickly, but I think whether you do it quickly or if you do it over you know, five or six months, it's still so, so hard. Um, but no, I, I, no, I don't, I don't miss it. I'm, I'm ready to be home. I'm, I was, I'm ready for some, like TLC and some comfort so yeah just to get back to normal I think and one of the other questions from the girls is if you could only actually do a part of the Appalachian Trail so if you only had say four to seven days what section would you recommend what's like the most scenic or what you saw is the most amazing to be honest this is a strange one but I'd probably actually say the White Mountains and I had a massive love-hate relationship with the White Mountains you know i I, some days like I loved it for, for the views and for the challenge and for for the whole experience other days I hated it for for the challenge for the rocks for the climbing um but I if I was to do any section again I'd definitely go back to the White Mountains but I'd probably do it by going from hut to hut to hut and just do a bit a little bit more civilized but that was just a stunning a really really stunning part of the world um really really enjoyed it all of the sections I like, were just beautiful in their own right like there was I mean that was the incredible thing like you were never you were never never bored like every view was different and you could have just taken thousands and thousands and thousands of different photos and it was just stunning and beautiful so any you know I'd recommend any part of the Appalachian Trail. What would you say was your sort of key learning about yourself from this experience? Um that you can sometimes think you're never making progress and you're never going to get there when you have like a big goal or a big dream. But actually, if you persevere, if you keep going, if you really break it down into smaller and smaller chunks and just keep moving forward, that you will actually get there. I think also being able to ask people for for help, being able to allow yourself to be vulnerable, allow your emotions to come out and to feel how you feel and to know that actually every day doesn't have to be... um, and this sounds weird coming from me, but every day doesn't have to be this positive, positive, amazing, incredible day. And sometimes you have to go through these dark patches, these go through the rocks, you know, go through the, get through the water, get through these tough sections. But no, once you've done it, it will actually make you, make you stronger. And I think, 
I think it has given me more belief in myself and more internal confidence and just knowing that actually if I persevere and I focus that I can get it done if I have that belief in myself and and also have the support of the people around me you know the support of the Tough Girl tribe has been incredible and you know people have said oh you're doing this solo and unsupported but actually I was so supported you know maybe not with having people physically there but having just knowing that I had so many people on my side having so many people on my team and just just being there and knowing that they were sending me so much like love and best wishes and were just rooting for me I think that made a that made a huge difference and well I think that's a really lovely way to to sort of finish the interview is is around being grateful for all the amazing support that you've had along the way but also about setting yourself a goal and taking steps every single day towards achieving that goal and you've just done absolutely incredibly well and of course the final question of the interview is going to be what is next (laughs) what is next is next isn't going to be a physical challenge it's going to be a mental challenge so I'm actually going back to university in October to do my master's in gender and women's studies so yeah I'm super excited about that I think that's gonna be really fun it's something I'm really really passionate about and obviously now having the platform tough girl challenges I want to use that um, to inspire and motivate more more women and I want to understand more about how I can help to to change what I see as you know inequalities and how I can give back through tough girl challenges and yeah so that's what that is what's next is my master's um, which will be starting on the 4th of October. But then I don't know about physical challenges. I think for me, it will just be a case of just trying to get my my fitness back and my, not I've lost my health, but trying to just get back onto, you know, feeling strong again and energised and just, uh, just, yeah, recover. Oh, Sarah, you are such a huge inspiration. You really are. Like everything you've done, every challenge that you've done and in, you know, setting up Tough Girl Challenges and setting up the podcast and just spreading this amazing word about encouraging women and girls to go after their goals and dreams. And you're just a shining example of what can happen when you actually do that. So just well done on your incredible achievement. Like We are all so, so proud of you and that you have proved that you're well and truly one hell of a tough girl oh, thank you hey tribe how are you all doing i hope you're all fabulously well i honestly cannot believe that we are halfway through september i remember talking about the appalachian trail at the beginning of the year my plans for it and the fact that i've gone out and done it i actually have no idea how I've done it. It, The time has just flown by so, so much. Now, if you're new to the podcast, you're probably thinking, what is the tribe? Why does she keep saying hi, tribe? The tribe is basically a closed Facebook group that I set out for the female listeners of the Tough Girl podcast so that the listeners around the world can connect with each other to support one another and to help each other with their own personal challenges. So if you are a female, then please do come and check out the closed Facebook group. It is so incredibly supportive. And to be honest, I could spend hours in there. I just love reading about everybody's accomplishments and what people are going after, what their goals are, what their ambitions are, and seeing the support that every single member of the tribe is providing for the other women in the group It is so, so inspiring. Now I have mentioned as well, you know, I've talked about doing the Appalachian trail, 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 solo and unsupported. But like I said, I've always been supported and I have to give a massive shout out to the tough girl team who have been behind the scenes running, the the tribe, the Facebook page, helping me out with my social media, helping me out with LinkedIn, helping out with the website and doing everything that I could not possibly do while I was on the trail. So a massive thank you to Ellen, to Ray, to Pamela, to Evie, to Alison, to Claire and Rachel. You guys have just been phenomenal. You have just complete, taken complete ownership and just been so wonderfully supportive and I honestly could not do it without your support so thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for everything that you've done over over the past few months it has been incredible now 
Um, the other big thank you has to go to Flynn Jones as well. So one of the things I wanted to do was to, while I was on the Appalachian Trail, was to share my journey. And how I decided to do this was to vlog um, every day my experiences. And Flynn was incredibly kind and incredibly generous. And he volunteered to help me with the editing because, again, there's just no way I could have done this while I was out um, on the trail. And I don't think either of, of us realized how hard it would be, A, for me to to vlog, but also to actually get the footage uploaded and sent over to Flynn. And he has just been doing a phenomenal job. He's also had help from Gemma as well. So Gemma Smith, one of our Seven Women, Seven Challenges, she stepped in when Flynn had to go on holiday for 10 days. So big thank you to Gemma as well. But he has been putting out these incredible vlogs. And to be honest, I know this is going to sound really vain probably but I love going back and watching them because it's just bringing back such incredible memories from the trail even when I am emotional and crying and I know there's lots more videos to come we do have um, 100 days obviously to come out so big shout out to Flint if you haven't gone and checked out the YouTube videos then please do go and check out the YouTube channel you will love what you see on there all the podcasts are also shared through the YouTube channel as well and it'll give you a lot more of a sense especially around the planning the preparation and what it was like for me while I was out there um, every single day so definitely worth watching now I haven't really mentioned it um at this well Caroline did the introduction but patrons so one of the ways that I actually funded my hike and one of the ways that I support myself and allow and which allows me to produce the podcast and this awesome content is through the support of patrons so there is a website called patreon which is basically for supporters of the tough girl podcast for supporters of the vlog for the supporters of the mission and the message that i am putting out there to increase the amount of female role models which allows individuals to sponsor me a financial amount every single month from one dollar a month up to 20 25 dollars a month and it makes a massive massive difference and while I've been away generally what I do is I add people's names onto the website at the end of every single month but because I've been away and had very very limited access I haven't been able to thank the individuals who have come on board to support me throughout this hike so I'm just going to run through their names now and honestly thank you so much for becoming a patron it makes such a massive difference and I please do excuse me if I pronounce your name wrong I do apologize um but Stan Rudd, Kirsty Gwynne-Jones, Shona McPherson, Naomi Free Reach, Sarah Mill, Dmitry Zadvarnitsky, Heather Lee, Monica, Monica Hans, Rachel W, Jen Gibbard, Sarah Tudhope, Catherine DeFair, Linda Bakley, Damien Day, Demania Day, Anna Fright. Demania, I hope I'm saying your name right. I know you're in New Zealand and I know you're going to be doing a massive run soon or really, really long walk on um, the Tiwaroa Trail. So I hope I'm saying it right. Anna Flight, Katie Stallard, Donna Shackle. Oh, I'm, guys, I'm so sorry. I know I'm butchering all your names. Alexander Chris, Anna Brown, Naomi Singley. Bridget Yeager you guys are my latest patrons and you guys are phenomenal thank you so much for becoming part of the team want to do a quick big shout outs as well to um to Mike Gray, Kate Hovers, Sarah Morgan, Louise Dunn, Woody and Juliet Townsend who also contributed um to my hike while I was out on the Appalachian Trail I really do appreciate all of the support that I have received. I'm now back in the UK and I have to say I'm doing lots of rest and recovery, just trying to get myself, um, or just trying to get everything back to together again, really. I'm still like a little bit brain dead everything isn't really sort of firing 100 and i'm still pretty tired but um yeah i'm gonna get that fixed i'm gonna start the daily podcast up again so that will be interesting and what i'm gonna do as well is actually go back and do the daily podcast from while i was on the appalachian trail if that makes sense so that i'll go back watch the youtube videos and talk through what i was feeling what i was experiencing just also partly so that I have um, a record of what it was like while I was out on on the Appalachian Trail. I know I've got the vlog, but also to go back and see what it triggers in me, what memories, because the vlog, the vlogs only show generally, you know, eight to 10 minutes of my of my day. And obviously, you know, 
and that's normally out of like 12 hours so 12 hours I'll be sleeping or 10 10 to 12 hours I'll be sleeping the rest of the time I will be walking or or eating or filtering water or you know engaging with people all these different things so you do only get to see a very small tiny glimpse of it and I, th- I think it will be really good or really interesting to continue the daily podcast because now this is all about, for me, about the, the rest and recovery. So it's going to be an interesting couple of months as I get my strength back. The other thing is, you know, I obviously I preloaded all of the podcast episodes up until last week, last Tuesday. So that was about another 15 episodes. And I just need to get back in the swing of things of getting the podcast episodes coming out every single Tuesday. And they will be coming out every Tuesday, 7am UK time. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. I don't know how we're doing for downloads. The big goal this year is to go for half a million downloads. Um, As soon as I upload this podcast episode, I'll be able to find out how we're doing in that area. And I'll obviously update you all. But if you haven't told a friend, just tell one friend, tell a work colleague, somebody you run with, somebody you cycle with, somebody who you think could benefit from listening to these incredibly inspiring women, because this is about challenging yourself. It, it, It is about pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. And it's going after those big dreams and those big goals that I know you have. Have. The fact that you're listening to this podcast already tells me that you want to do something extraordinary. You just want to get out there and do something which is going to help you to change your life. And I just want you to know that you can do it. Go for it. Decide what it is that you want. Write it down. Put a plan in t- place and take that first step. And, you know, the journey, it's its like I've said before, it's not going to be all sunshine and roses, there's going to be some hard points, but you can do it. You can get through the challenging situations and it will make you stronger. I also want to do a final shout out to Caroline Wellingham, who has done a phenomenal job of interviewing me. She is obviously my sister, but she has been so incredibly supportive and has to be one of the most inspirational people that I know. And when I was out on the trail, sometimes I would say to myself, you know, what would Caroline do in this situation? And I'd always get the right answer. But please do go check out her website as well, raisethebarlifecoaching.com. Caroline is a qualified um sorry, accredited life and career coach. She's a member of the International Institute of Coaching and Mentoring, and she can help you to change your life. She can take you, if you've got that idea, she will help you to make it happen. She's she's an incredible coach. She'll help you get the results, results that you want. If you do want to email Caroline to arrange a free consultation, then please do send her an email, caroline at raisethebarlifecoaching.co.uk. So thank you so much for listening. Make sure you subscribe and I'll be back with you next Tuesday for our regular scheduled programming with another awesome woman who's going to be sharing more about an amazing challenge that she has overcome. All right, well, take care, lots of love and I'll speak to you soon. All right, bye. Bye.